there are times when you know a patient might pass away um, because of you know lack of access to certain services. It's hard to witness children being denied care. You sometimes go to bed at night, you wonder, how can I function in a system like that? A system that's focused to deny care. <laughs> it can cause you to, to give up hope. Meet Dr. Mike Curley, family physician in Northern Ontario, and one of the few doctors who works in the tiny flying communities in the northernmost part of the province. For the past 10 years, he's been fighting a healthcare system that he says actually hurts his patients. But this is Canada. We have some of the best healthcare in the world, and it's for everybody, no matter what, right? Or is that just something we like to tell ourselves? Sioux Lookout, Ontario, a town of 5,000 and a medical hub for the region. If you live in the northernmost part of the province and you get sick, this is one of the places you come. It's also home base for Dr. Curlew. Hey, how are you doing? How was it since he last got sick and stuff? Dr. Curlew's first patient of the day is Bernice Boyce. It's improving. It's improving, that's mm -hmm. good, that's good. She's brought her 14-year-old son Joshua to see him, in part for his asthma. And he's not coughing as much as he was before? No. Okay, okay, that's good, that's good. Is he still taking um, the purple puffer, the Advair? What you should know is that for this appointment to happen, for Joshua to get the medical help he needs, he and his mom had to get on a plane and travel 500 kilometers south from their community. When we were back home, sometimes we didn't even sleep for three nights straight. I know, I know. I he know. would wake up coughing and coughing. struggling to yeah. breathe. Yeah. It was really risky for him to be there because of his asthma. We don't have anything back home. And that's why we are here. The thing is, it's not just Joshua and Bernice who had to leave their home to get health care. So did every person here. This is a 100-bed facility attached to the hospital in Sioux Lookout. It's where patients from the northern communities fly in and stay. And the beds are full. They're almost always full. I've been staying here in the hospital for the last uh, about 18 months now. 18 months yeah, because, in this room, uh, alone. Meet Stefan Fiddler uh, from Bearskin Lake. I'm on uh, dialysis. And uh, also I'm uh, going blind. So I need some help while I'm here. And um, I left my family in Bearskin, uh, which is very hard to do. Uh, very lonely. <clears throat> it's very lonely here. You miss family and uh, miss uh, things I used to do. How does that make you feel that you had to leave? This is, uh, this is Canada. I think all Canadians should uh, get the same services as people that live in, down south. Sorry for Stefan's in an impossible situation. If he goes home to his community, he'll likely die. And yet, in a way, he's actually one of the lucky ones. Sure, the hostel is as busy as an airport, but not everyone who gets sick in the northern communities even gets to come here. Doctors have to request coverage for their patients and the government decides who gets to travel. Makes you wonder, if not everyone gets to come here, what's the situation in the communities farther north? I, I, I love going up there. The next day, Dr. Curlew flies the 500 kilometers north to Wapakika, where he's been working for 10 years. You look out the window and you see how remote it is. This part of northern Ontario is the size of France, with 45,000 people scattered in tiny indigenous communities, many of them you can only get to by plane. If you get sick in Wapakika, you come here, to the nursing station. You probably have to make your own way, of course. There's no ambulance. There's also no x-ray machine or ultrasound either. Can I get a high five? All right, all right. And there's only a doctor here for about a week every month. 
Three-year-old Chase is Dr. Curlew's first patient of the day. How's our man doing today? Ushu. He just woke up. He just woke yeah, up? Yeah, he's, uh, oh, he's sick right now. Oh, boy. He's feeling pretty sick, eh? Yeah. yeah. It just wasn't working. Today, Chase is here for his rash. Yeah. But what his dad, Jason Baxter, is really stressed yeah. about is his son's yeah. recent yeah. allergy attack. He almost died in Thunder Bay. I know. Yeah. I know, yeah. So, yeah. lucky thing he was actually in town when it happened, I eh? know. And not I know. up here. I know. So, so, so now he walks around with a little EpiPen everywhere he goes. That's good. That's good. That's in my jacket right now. That's good. In Wapakika, a simple that's peanut good. allergy is a big deal. What if there's no medication? Dr. Curlew says they've run out before. And if there are any complications, maybe help doesn't arrive in time. But if he would have had peanuts up here on, in the community, he probably would have probably would have died, like up here. What's that like to live here? Well, we don't let him go anywhere to go visit other people's homes just because of that, in case something does happen over there, because of the, what it, all the time it takes for medical help to get here. So you don't let your son go to any other house in the community because of his allergies? He has to stay at home now. Now that we know, I just don't want to take that chance of Isn't sending him over there. Yeah. One more high five, awesome. okay? All right. Thanks so much, Jason. Hey, right, doctor. All right, you take care, okay? Take care, man. All right. At the end of the day, what really hits home are the difficulties people have getting treatment for everyday concerns. This is Jayla. She's seven. She's falling behind at school. And her mom is just trying to get her speech therapy. Hi, Jayla. Hi. How are you doing today? Good. You doing good? How's school going? Good. But speech therapy basically doesn't exist here. But that's a real problem in our region, is just getting kids access, you know, access to those services. Mm -hmm. And even when we do, sometimes we can only get them once, you know? And it's very difficult to get things on an ongoing basis, you know? Mm -hmm. But we're gonna try our best. We'll try another letter and see what we can do. Mm -hmm. Give me a high five. You keep up the good work in school, okay? Remember, you can do it. Dr. Curlew says right. he's already written several letters trying to get therapy for Jayla. And that's the thing. In Wapakika, Curlew's as much an advocate as a doctor. On most days, he types letters more than he uses his stethoscope. One of the realities of life for a northern doctor is you work, sleep, and eat at the nursing station. I wonder how cold it is out there. Uh -huh. They were saying like minus 23, so. On this morning, Dr. Curlew is joined by Saul Mumakla. At least last night. Saul's know. official title is health advisor with the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And it's his job to improve the health care of his people. How many patients do you have to see today? Probably about 20 or so. Saul's in Wapakika to pick Dr. Curlew's brain about how things are going on the ground. We saw so many parents bring in their children looking for, you know, accessing developmental services, right? These services could fly into the community. There could be, th those things are all possible, right? Somehow we need to change that. Yeah. Saul grew up in Kingfisher Lake, just about 50 kilometers away from here. And so he knows firsthand the challenges in the region. Fresh on his mind are the three recent suicides here in Wapakika. And he points out it's not just basic medical needs that are lacking, it's mental health support as well. When you hear of a young girl, boy, 11, 12 years old, dying by suicide, it just pushes you to make more change, bring change for our people. We cannot give up. We cannot. What, what don't people understand about health care in your communities? I hear uh, a lot of, you know, the health care is broken. Um, when you actually think about it, it's not, it's not broken. It is, in fact, doing exactly the way it's been designed to, is to diminish the, the rights of our people, the health of our people. And uh, sometimes I'll even go as far as saying that the, the system is killing our people. Saul's also here to talk to patients who visit the clinic. After John McKay has his appointment with Dr. Curlew, Saul walks him home. Saul acknowledges it won't be easy to fix the health care problems here. And even though both provincial and federal governments have increased funding in recent years, Saul says that's not the answer. 
It's not just incremental changes. It's not adding money to the existing programs. Incremental change, in fact, you know, perpetuates the crisis in our communities. So we need to dismantle the system and rebuild it up from the community up. And Saul is hopeful that that's possible. This past summer, the provincial and federal governments, along with the Grand Chief, signed an agreement in principle to give health care here over to Indigenous control. Then the day ends. And as I catch up with Dr. Curlew again, off to make a house call, the reality on the ground hits hard. Hi. Hi, Bushu. How are Change you Change can't come fast enough for Donnie and Elsie Brown. That's good. Arms out like this? That's good. Donnie had a stroke good. four years ago. Like How do you find Donnie has, has been doing? Well, the right side. Yeah. He can't feel. feel. Yeah, yeah. Especially on his foot. Yeah, He yeah. gets cold, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, on that right side yeah. and stuff, yeah. Because that's the side that was weaker after the aneurysm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the four years since his stroke, Donnie's only had one single rehab appointment. One. That's, that's, that's very true. And so he's not getting any better. Yeah. You yeah. know that he has... Yeah. Right. Yeah. See you. Yeah. Now I don't see you there. No, you don't... Yeah, no. yeah. 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 I see you. Yeah. I see you now. Yeah. yeah. But then when you look over it, yeah. 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 Do you get a lot of help, like? No, it's just me. It's just you and uh, right? my girls. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I wish I could, you know, provide some home care, you know, yeah. because that would be something that people would get down south is someone to yeah. help, you know, because uh -huh. he needs a lot of assistance, you know. But, yeah. But we, uh, we don't have access to, to that kind of service. Mm hmm You know, so, um, yeah. Do you think you help people today? You know, they, they have this phrase in medicine called the Hippocratic Oath, right? To do no harm. And, you know, sometimes I view my role as a physician, sometimes is to minimize the harm that the system is automatically doing to people. So maybe I'm a harm minimizer. Do you ever kind of forget that this isn't normal? I, I think I think that's a real temptation, right? You you, you can <laughs> you forget what normal normal is. You have to remind yourself what normal is. You know, that's part of the fight or that's part of the battle. It's just not succumbing to the status quo, right? Continuing to fight, you know. You know, you, you see people that will tell you, we may be down now, but we're going to be up again. And they can tell you and, and say, don't give up. That's strength. My patients are way stronger than I am. Way stronger. 